Grandparents who show a great interest in their grandchildren are among the most precious people on this earth. What a marvelous positive social mirror they can be. My mother is like that. Even now, in her late 80s, she takes a deep personal interest in every one of her descendants. She writes us love letters. I was reading one the other day on a plane with tears streaming down my cheeks. I could call her up tonight and I know she'd say, Stephen, I want you to know how much I love you and how wonderful I think you are. She's constantly reaffirming. A strong intergenerational family is potentially one of the most fruitful, rewarding, and satisfying interdependent relationships. And many people feel the importance of that relationship. Look at the fascination we all had with roots some years ago. Each of us has roots and the ability to trace those roots, to identify our ancestors. The highest and most powerful motivation in doing that is not for ourselves only, but for our posterity, for the posterity of all mankind. As someone once observed, there are only two lasting bequests we can give our children one is roots, the other wings. Becoming a transition person. Among other things, I believe that giving wings to our children and to others means empowering them with the freedom to rise above negative scripting that had been passed down to us. I believe it means becoming what my friend and associate, Dr. Terry Warner, calls a transition person. Instead of transferring those scripts to the next generation, we can change them. And we can do it in a way that will build relationships in the process. If your parents abused you as a child, that does not mean that you have to abuse your own children. Yet there's plenty of evidence to indicate that you will tend to live out that script. But because you're proactive, you can rewrite the script. You can choose not only not to abuse your children, but to affirm them, to script them in positive ways. You can write it in your personal mission statement and into your mind and heart. You can visualize yourself living in harmony with that mission statement in your daily private victory. You can take steps to love and forgive your own parents, and if they are still living, to build a positive relationship with them by seeking to understand. A tendency that's run through your family for generations can stop with you. You're a transition person a link between the past and the future. And your own change can affect many, many lives downstream. One powerful transition person of the 20th century, Anwar Sadat, left us as part of his legacy of profound understanding of the nature of change. Sadat stood between a past that had created a huge wall of suspicion, fear, hate and misunderstanding between Arabs and Israelis, and a future in which increased conflict and isolation seemed inevitable. Efforts at negotiation had been met with objections on every scale even to formalities and procedural points, to an insignificant comma or period in the text of proposed agreements. While others attempted to resolve the tense situation by hacking at the leaves, Sadat drew upon his earlier centering experience in a lonely prison cell and went to work on the route. And in doing so, he changed the course of history for millions of people. He records in his autobiography. It was then that I drew, almost unconsciously, on the inner strength I had developed in cell 54 of Cairo Central Prison A strength, call it a talent or capacity, for change. I found that faced a highly complex situation, and that I couldn't hope to change it until I had armed myself with the necessary psychological and intellectual capacity. My contemplation of life and human nature in that secluded place had taught me that he who cannot change the very fabric of his thought will never be able to change reality, and will never, therefore, make any progress. Change real change comes from the inside out. It doesn't come from hacking at the leaves of attitude and behavior with quick fix personality ethic techniques. It comes from striking at the root the fabric of our thought, the fundamental, essential paradigms, which give definition to our character and create the lens through which we see the world. In the words of Amiel, moral truth can be conceived in thought. One can have feelings about it. One can will to live it. But moral truth may have been penetrated and possessed in all these ways, and escape us still. Deeper even than consciousness there is our being itself our very substance, our nature. Only those truths which have entered into this last region, which have become ourselves, become spontaneous and involuntary as well as voluntary, unconscious as well as conscious, are really our life that is to say, something more than property. So long as we are able to distinguish any space whatever between truth and us we remain outside it. The thought, the feeling, the desire or the consciousness of life may not be quite life. To become divine is then the aim of life. Then only can truth be said to be ours beyond the possibility of loss. It is no longer outside us, nor in a sense even in us, but we are it, and it is we. Achieving unity oneness with ourselves, with our loved ones, with our friends and working associates, is the highest and best and most delicious fruit of the seven habits. 
Most of us have tasted this fruit of true unity from time to time in the past, as we have also tasted the bitter, lonely fruit of disunity and we know how precious and fragile unity is. Obviously building dot a character of total integrity and living the life of love and service that creates such unity isn't easy. It isn't quick fix. But it's possible. It begins with the desire to center our lives on correct principles, to break out of the paradigms created by other centers and the comfort zones of unworthy habits. Sometimes we make mistakes, we feel awkward. But if we start with a daily private victory and work from the inside out, the results will surely come. As we plant the seed and patiently weed and nourish it, we begin to feel the excitement of real growth and eventually taste the incomparably delicious fruits of a congruent, effective life. Again, I quote Emerson, that which we persist in doing becomes easier not that the nature of the task has changed, but our ability to do has increased. By centering our lives on correct principles and creating a balanced focus between doing and increasing our ability to do, we become empowered in the task of creating effective, useful, and peaceful lives, for ourselves, and for our posterity. A personal note. As I conclude this book, I would like to share my own personal conviction concerning what I believe to be the source of correct principles. I believe that correct principles are natural laws, and that God, the Creator and Father of us all, is the source of them, and also the source of our conscience. I believe that to the degree people live by this inspired conscience, they will grow to fulfill their natures, to the degree that they do not they will not rise above the animal plane. I believe that there are parts to human nature that cannot be reached by either legislation or education, but require the power of God to deal with. I believe that as human beings, we cannot perfect ourselves. To the degree to which we align ourselves with correct principles, divine endowments will be released within our nature in enabling us to fulfill the measure of our creation. In the words of Teilhard de Chardin, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. I personally struggle with much of what I have shared in this book. But the struggle is worthwhile and fulfilling. It gives meaning to my life and enables me to love, to serve, and to try again. Again, T. S. Eliot expresses so beautifully my own personal discovery and conviction, we must not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we began and to know the place for the first time. Afterward questions I am often asked. Frankly, I've always been embarrassed by personal questions like some in this afterward. But I am asked them so often and with such interest that I've gone ahead and included them here. Many of these questions and answers were also included in Living the Seven Habits. The Seven Habits was published in 1989. Given your experiences in the many years that have followed, what would you change, add, or subtract? I'm not responding lightly, but frankly I wouldn't change anything. I might go deeper and apply wider but I have had the opportunity to do that in some of the books released since then. For example, over 250,000 individuals were profiled showing Habit 3, Put First Things First, as the habit most neglected. So, the First Things First book, published 1996, went deeper into Habits 2 and 3 but also added more substance and illustrations for all the other habits. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families applied the Seven Habits framework of thinking into building strong, Happy, highly effective families. Also, my son, Sean, applied the framework to the unique needs, interests and challenges of teens in a very visually attractive, entertaining, and edifying way in the seven habits of highly effective teens. We have also had tens of thousands of people tell us of the significant impact of becoming the creative force of their own lives through internalizing the seven habits. 76 of them shared the details of their fascinating stories of courage and inspiration in living the seven habits showing the transforming power of the principles in all kinds of personal, family, and organizational settings regardless of their circumstances, organizational position, or prior life experiences. What have you learned about the seven habits since the book's release? I have learned or had reinforced many things. I'll briefly mention 10 learnings. 1. The importance of understanding the difference between principles and values. Principles are natural laws that are external to us and that ultimately control the consequences of our actions. Values are internal and subjective and represent that which we feel strongest about in guiding our behavior. Hopefully we will come to value principles, so that we get the results we want now in a way that enables us to get even greater results in the future, which is how I define effectiveness. Everyone has values, even criminal gangs have values. Values govern people's behavior but principles govern the consequences of those behaviors. Principles are independent of us. 
They operate regardless of our awareness of them, acceptance of them, liking of them, belief in them, or obeying of them. I have come to believe that humility is the mother of all virtues. Humility says we are not in control, principles are in control, therefore we submit ourselves to principles. Pride says that we are in control, and since our values govern our behavior, we can simply do life our way. We may do so but the consequences of our behavior flow from principles not our values. Therefore we should value principles. 2. From experiences all over the world with this material I have come to see the universal nature of the principles undergirding this material. Illustrations and practices may vary and are culturally specific, but the principles are the same. I have found the principles contained in the seven habits in all six major world religions and have actually drawn upon quotations from sacred writings of those religions when teaching in those cultures. I have done this in the Middle East, India, Asia, Australia and the South Pacific, South America, Europe, North America, Africa, and among Native Americans and other indigenous peoples. All of us, men and women alike, face similar problems, have similar needs, and internally resonate with the underlying principles. There is an internal sense of the principle of justice or win slash win. There is an internal moral sense of the principle of responsibility, of the principle of purpose, of integrity, of respect, of cooperation, of communication, of renewal. These are universal. But practices are not. They are situationally specific. Every culture interprets universal principles in unique ways. 3. I have come to see the organizational implications of the seven habits, although, in the strict technical sense, an organization does not have habits. Its culture has norms or mores or social codes, which represent habits. An organization also has established systems, processes, and procedures. These represent habits. In fact, in the last analysis, all behavior is personal. It is individual even though it often is part of collective behavior in the form of decisions made by management regarding structure and systems, processes and practices. We have worked with thousands of organizations in most every industry and profession and have found that the same basic principles contained in the seven habits apply and define effectiveness. 4. You can teach all seven habits by starting with any one habit. And you can also teach one habit in a way that leads to the teaching of the other six. It's like a hologram where the whole is contained in a part and the part is contained in a whole. 5. Even though the seven habits represents an inside-out approach, it works most successfully when you start with the outside challenge and then take the inside-out approach. In other words, if you are having a relationship challenge, say a breakdown of communication and trust, this will define the nature of the needed inside-out approach and winning the kind of private victory that enables the public victory meeting that challenge. This is the reason I often teach habits for, 5, and 6 before I teach habits 1, 2, and 3. 6. Interdependence is 10 times more difficult than independence. It demands so much more mental and emotional independence to think win slash win when another person is into win slash lose, to seek to understand first when everything inside you cries out for understanding, and to search for a better third alternative when compromise is so much easier. In other words, to work successfully with others in creative cooperative ways requires an enormous amount of independence, internal security, and self-mastery. Otherwise, what we call interdependency is really counterdependency where people do the opposite to assert their independence, or codependency where they literally need the other person's weakness to fulfill their need and to justify their own weakness. 7. You can pretty well summarize the first three habits with the expression make and keep a promise. And you can pretty well summarize the next three habits with the expression involve others in the problem and work out the solution together. 8. The seven habits represents a new language even though there are fewer than a dozen unique words or phrases. This new language becomes a code, a shorthand way of saying a great deal. When you say to another was that a deposit or a withdrawal? Is that reactive or proactive? Is that synergistic or a compromise? Is that win slash win or win slash lose or lose slash win? Is that putting first things first or second things first? Is that beginning with the means in mind or the end in mind? I've seen entire cultures transformed by a wide understanding of and commitment to the principles and concepts symbolized by these very special code words. 9. Integrity is a higher value than loyalty. Or better put, integrity is the highest form of loyalty. Integrity means being integrated or centered on principles not on people, organizations, or even family. You will find that the root of most issues that people are dealing with is is it popular, acceptable, political, or is it right? When we prioritize being loyal to a person or group over doing what we feel to be right, 
we lose integrity. We may temporarily gain popularity or build loyalty, but, downstream, this loss of integrity will undermine even those relationships. It's like bad-mouthing someone behind their back. The person you are temporarily united with through bad-mouthing someone else knows you would bad-mouth them under different pressures and circumstances. In a sense, the first three habits represent integrity and the next three loyalty, but they are totally interwoven. Over time, integrity produces loyalty. If you attempt to reverse them and go for loyalty first, you will find yourself temporizing and compromising integrity. It's better to be trusted than to be liked. Ultimately, trust and respect will generally produce love. 10. Living the seven habits is a constant struggle for everyone. Everyone falters from time to time on each of the seven and sometimes all seven simultaneously. They really are simple to understand but difficult to consistently practice. They are common sense but what is common sense is not always common practice. Which habit do you personally have the greatest difficulty with? Habit 5. When I am really tired and already convinced I'm right, I really don't want to listen. I may even pretend to listen. Basically I am guilty of the same thing I talk about, listening with the intent to reply, not to understand. In fact, in some sense, I struggle almost daily with all seven habits. I have conquered none of them. I see them more as life principles that we never really master and that the closer we come to their mastery, the more aware we become of how far we really have yet to go. It's like the more you know the more you know you don't know. This is why I often gave my university students 50% of the grade for the quality of their questions and the other 50% for the quality of their answer to their questions. Their true level of knowledge is better revealed that way. Similarly, the seven habits represents an upward cycle. Habit 1 at a high level is vastly different from habit 1 at a lower level. To be proactive at the beginning level may only be awareness of the space between stimulus and response. At the next level it may involve a choice such as, not to get back at or to get even. At the next level, to give feedback. At the next level, to ask forgiveness. At the next level, to forgive. At the next, to forgive parents. At the next level, to forgive dead parents. And the next level, to simply not take offense. You are the vice chairman of Franklin Covey Company. Does Franklin Covey live the seven habits? We try to. Continually trying to live what we teach is one of our most fundamental values. But we don't do it perfectly. Like any other business, we're challenged by changing market realities and by integrating the two cultures of the former Covey Leadership Center and Franklin Quest. The merger took place in the summer of 1997. It takes time, patience, and persistence in applying the principles and the true test of our success will be in the long run. No snapshot will give an accurate picture. Any airplane is off track much of the time but just keeps coming back to the flight plan. Eventually, it arrives at its destination. This is true with all of us as individuals, families, or organizations. The key is to have an end in mind and a shared commitment to constant feedback and constant course correction. Why 7? Why not 6 or 8 or 10 or 15? What is so sacred about 7? Nothing is sacred about 7, it just so happens that the 3 private victory habits freedom to choose, choice, action, precede the three public victory habits, respect, understanding, creation, and then there is one to renew the rest and that equals seven.